Now, I, I quote Jomini once more. A retreat, even when executed in the most skillful manner and by an army in good condition, always gives the advantage to the pursuing army. And its difficulty increases in proportion to the skill exhibited by the enemy in conducting the pursuit. So Meade's first and foremost dilemma, and I'm playing a little devil's advocate here with, uh, with, with Troy here and Troy's theory that he just mentioned, is um, Meade has to figure out where Lee is going to do. Uh, and on July 4th, uh, 10 o'clock, Meade writes or wires Henry Hallett. He says, I make a reconnaissance tomorrow to ascertain what the intention of the enemy is. My cavalry will now, now are now moving toward South Mountain Passes, and should the enemy retreat, should the enemy retreat, I shall pursue him on his flanks. On his flanks. Now, it's like he had a, a copy of Jomini right in his saddlebag. Because Jomini's going to say, it is generally better to direct the pursuit upon the flank of the retreating columns. And what's me doing? He's doing exactly that. The advantages here once again to the pursuing army. Jomini, one more time, one more quote. The boldness and activity of the pursuit will depend upon the character of the commanders and upon the physique and morale of the two armies. It's like this is a textbook operation here. Now Meade has to be certain, this is why I'm going to tie into what uh, Troy previously said, Meade has to be certain about Lee's intentions before committing to a pursuit because he needs to know where to move his base of supplies. He can't afford to make a mistake because changing his base of supply, right, and here again, Troy touched upon it, would involve the movement of enormous amounts of men and material. And once he started, it would take an awful long time to halt that and reverse that operation. Now, the Union Six Corps is harassing Lee on his retreat. And now General John Sedgwick sends a message to Meade in that he believes, Sedgwick, he believes Meade is fortifying the mountain passes. And this is going to give Meade something to think about. And it's going to play right into what is Lee doing. What do I do? So. By, by here, now I'm going to go over to Clausewitz. And he says, by moving an army at a deliberately slow pace and having a strong rear guard, it make it difficult for me to determine if Lee was indeed fortifying the mountains or retreating. Uh, this is right out of Clausewitz. And everybody, they're going right according, right according to these theories. Uh, me could be good. Meade, these guys took quite a hit, too. And he needs to supply and feed and furnish his army, and he has to maintain his line of supplies. That's why this is a critical juncture during this campaign. Now, Lee is aware of these theories also. And what's he going to do? Well, he's going to protect his flanks with his cavalry and establishes as I said before, that strong rear guard. And Mike is going to flush, that, flush this out um, in just a minute. But you can see, I hope you can see, and anyway, I hope I'm making a point where this retreat and this pursuit is a textbook example of these military theories. And Lee's great escape from Gettysburg is successful in part because he employed those principles in a skillful and timely manner. So that's my piece, and Mike's going to fill in uh, the rest of the action for you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Bill.
as Troy and Bill and I have discussed many times, everything is connected. That's why you study the whole campaign from June 3rd to July 14th, and even before that and after it. Everything is connected. Nothing happens in a vacuum. As Bill shows you, these are all rules, and that's why this incredible uh, retreat works out pretty well for the Confederates. A lot of people say Lee lost the Battle of Gettysburg, and he does lose the tactical battle. But his army is going to live, mainly because of what he takes out of these fields. Uh, Kent, I believe he uh, estimates Lee's army is fed for four to five months from the stuff he takes out of here in Pennsylvania. So in Lee's eyes, this is a victory. And this is part of it, getting these trains through here to get uh, out to Virginia. Um, I want to thank Mr. Robel. This is his property. For a year, I've been knocking on this door, nobody home. Five minutes ago, when Troy was talking, I see the car pull in. I come rolling over here. He's right over there. Wave your hand, Mr. Robel. He has given us permission to sit on this lovely, incredible property. I want you to look at the view that you would see if it wasn't for these trees in front. That's the Valley of Gettysburg. Nice colored picture. Troy had these made. Pretty intense, huh? What a view from over here. Troy was talking about Raven Rock. There it is. The secret Pentagon. Oh, you're going to have to erase that. Oh, boy. Am I, oh, that's an inside joke, but I'm in trouble now. Okay. Uh, to set the stage on the retreat and the fighting up on this road, it's going to occur about starting about 10 o'clock at night. It has been raining since noon. During this engagement, all through here for the next five hours, there is a huge thunder and lightning storm. This little ribbon of a road is about half the size it was in 1863. And I'm going to read you something that a soldier says. Uh, this is from Captain Boone, Company B, 1st West Virginia Cavalry, which is part of Richmond's Brigade. Richmond is the replacement for who? Bondsworth, that's right. So this is the first West Virginia. Here's what he says. Up this narrow, unknown way, in a drizzling rain and enveloped in darkness, so deep that the riders, though jostling together, could not see each other, the exhausted, sleepy soldiers on their weary animals slowly toiled. The steel scabbers, the only sound that broke the deep silence until near the top, when suddenly a mouth of fire opened in the gloom and the thunder of cannon shook the heights, while down the narrow road came the fiery uh, hailstorm, uh, though we were on the lookout for danger, the column was startled at the suddenness of the discharge. And before we had time to recover, from either side of the road came the rattling fire of musketry, lighting up with the strange glow of that Rocky Mountain summit. The leading squadron, the first Michigan, broke and fell back on the second, and then fell back on the third. And the, the uh, Michigan Cavalry Brigade was jammed down the road in confusion. That's the start of the Battle of Monterey. What's happening, you all have the maps. Kilpatrick is coming up the Waynesboro Emmitsburg Pike, and he's looking for the Confederate wagon train. A young man who lived up here, Charles uh, Berman. I have his picture here, just a moment. There he is. He's a young farmer's boy at the time. He has seen the Confederate wagon train do, uh, go down the road over on the other side. So he jumps on a horse and he rides down the Waynesboro Emmitsburg Turnpike. And he runs into the Michigan advance. And they send him to General Custer. And Custer sends him to General Kilpatrick. And he tells Kilpatrick, the wagon train's up here, which spurs Kilpatrick to have his uh, whole division. And by the way, 4,500 cavalry with three batteries of artillery up the Waynesboro Emmitsburg Road to hit this wagon train up here. Now again, it's raining and it's really dark. As they come up that road, they're going to meet a 12-year-old girl, Hetty Zellinger. She says to them, the Confederates have cannons and, and, and men all over the hill. Don't go up, don't go up. Kilpatrick laughs at her and says, ah, we take nothing of that. We're going up. 
she is actually going to ride in the saddle with one of the first uh, Michigan soldiers and direct them up the mountainside. Now, it's 10 o'clock at night. There's a storm going on. She's 12 years old. Where are her parents? <laughs> what is she doing out in a rainstorm all by herself where there's cavalry fighting a battle? What is that about? It seems like a story that just can't be true. It's true. We have two letters from those uh, Michigan cavalry boys who send her thanks after the war for her help in, in directing them up this road. Now, um, there's so much confusion about the fighting up this road because none of the accounts reconcile with each other. George E. Mack, who's the command, uh, captain of Company B of the 1st Virginia Cavalry Battalion, they are the only ones here. He's got about 90 men. This flank is supposed to be protected by Grumble Jones along with Robertson's brigade, but they get blocked behind on the wagon train. They can't get here. So all the Confederates that got here is 90 guys, and he's got one cannon. And he says they have two rounds of ammunition. There's 4,500 Union cavalrymen coming up that road. This uh, Captain Emac, he's 21 years old, another tough-as-nails warrior. If Lee ever wanted anyone better, he couldn't have found a better man than George E. Mack. Because George and his 90 men are going to hold off Kilpatrick's cavalry for five long hours right up this road. This road, I don't know, I didn't hear Troy before. Did he describe this road as a bottleneck? It is. Let me describe you what one, uh, tell you about what one soldier, how he describes it. Imagine a long column of cavalry winding its way up the mountain on a road dug out of the mountainside which sloped at an angle of 30 degrees, just wide enough for four horses to march abreast. On one side, a deep abyss, and the other side, an impassable barrier in the shape of a steep embankment. The hour, 10 o'clock at night, a drizzle, drizzling rain falling, the sky overcast and so dark as literally not to be able to see one's own hand if placed within the foot of the visions of Oregon. That's what these men are facing coming up this mountain. But they're facing George e Emack and his 90 men. Now, the original, like I said, so much is, is confused about the fighting. But I think all of us who are studying this, you can come to a kind of consensus that there are three separate attacks coming up the hill. By, uh, and actually, I'm thinking four now. But that's neither here nor there. I'll try and explain it. Uh, Kilpatrick and his men come up. First Michigan is leading up the hill. Emac says that his men are about 50 feet high, so about the height of a five-story building, and that's actually at where the first gate of the ISP uh, uh, contracting place up here, the big uh, quarry, that's where their first gate is. That's where I, at least that's my opinion. As they come up, you heard me describe, as they come up, they, they think there's someone come, uh, that there's danger up there, but they don't know where. All of a sudden, the one cannon lets go, and Emac and his men, he's got about 20 only down at the road. The rest are back up here in reserve. They start firing. They drive the Union Cavalry back. They're so surprised. Emac is going to charge them with eight men. <laughs> eight men. 4,500 down the road, he's charging with eight men. And you know what? He surprised them, and he drives them all back on each other. One, one uh, squadron on another, all the way back down the road. Custer's men go flying down the road. They go over a mile. It takes Kilpatrick and Custer over an hour to reorganize his men for the second attempt up the hill. Again, he has brought more men now. He has, and it's hard to determine. My opinion, he's got about 35, 40 now. He brings some down from the top of the mountain. And they, they're on either side of the road. And again, they hit him with the canister. Now, this, this Napoleon is firing canister, but it's not doing any damage to this Michigan boys because they can't depress the barrel. The angle is so steep that it's going over their heads. But if you're walking up this road in the middle of night in pitch black, and you can hear that canister going by you. Boy, that's pretty frightening. You all know what canister is, right? Little tin can filled with, uh, what, 25, 50 iron golf balls. Pretty deadly stuff. But luckily, it doesn't do much damage. So Kilpatrick's a little frustrated. Emac has frustrated him here twice. Now, Berman tells him there is a possibility to have someone go around the left flank because the hill isn't that high at that point down at the bottom and actually go up the flank and flank Emac's men, capture the cannon and his men. Uh, he sends part of the 18th Pennsylvania Cavalry around to the left. Emac sees them. He immediately retreats back up the hill and finds another position. 
Where this position is today, I don't think anybody knows. I don't think anybody ever will, unless George E. Mac comes back and tells us. But it's somewhere between here and, and the bottom of the hill, OK? Kilpatrick will come up again. He'll shoot the cannon off again, fire from both sides of the road. Again, they're sent back down the road. Remember I told you that Emac said his cannon had two, two canisters. Where are all these canisters coming from? I don't know. Emac says he's got two. Kent uh, imagines, uh, estimates he has 12. Everyone says different. If you ask this, the Michigan boys, every two seconds they're getting hit by canister. It's like they got 30 up here. That's what I mean by the accounts. They don't register. They don't make sense. They don't reconcile. reconcile. So you do a guess. You guesstimate. You try and piece together and try to make some kind of common sense of it. What I can be sure of is that the final attack of Kilpatrick's men against Amac and his full 90 men is right here. This is the site of the Claremont Hotel. Got that other picture? Right behind you is the Lodge House. This is the Claremont Hotel. Nice color version. Again, provided by Joe and Rex uh, Benchoff. Wonderful people. This hotel was sitting right there. It's right there. The foundation is actually still there. You can see it. Huge hotel. OK? Both Charles Berman and David Miller, who will be the proprietor of the Claremont House. He's a young man at the time of the battle. And he's actually a clerk at the Monterey House up the hill, where we'll go a little later. Both of them say the Confederates had their cannon here in the road in front of the, Mon of the Claremont Hotel. Now, when you were down at the last stop, you saw the railroad track there? Remember that? On the other side of that railroad track is the original Waynesboro Emmitsburg Turnpike. This part of the road here does not exist in 1863. The original road is on the other side of the railroad, and then it swings up, comes up this ridge, and runs right in front of this road right here. It ran right in front of the hotel, OK? So it's my belief that at the corner on the long down slope, that's where they had the cannon. Because like I said, this is the only place where you have two people say that's where it was. Two boys who were here at the time. You can't get better than that for primary. So this is where the final fight was. They are desperate. I mean, it's 90 guys. He does have one cannon. How many rounds of ammunition, I don't know. But he seems to have a lot, OK? Even though he says, no, uh, anyway. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. But finally, the pressure of all these cavalrymen coming up, and they are fighting hand to mouth. Some of them dismounted. They're on both sides of the road, up on the, uh, the, uh, the, the blade, the blade, not the blade, uh, the cliff, as we say, coming down. They are fighting horribly, and they push Emac and his men away. This bottleneck is now cleared, because you saw when we walked up here from where we walked. When you're on the summit, now it all opens up. There's no more bottleneck. The next bottleneck is down at Brown Springs, where the final stand will be by Emac and his men. Let me tell you a little bit about Emac in a letter that he writes to, I think, his sister. Oh, oh well, let me, let me do this first, though. This is the Claremont Hotel, and it was for 37 years uh, run by David Miller. Most of you didn't see it, but when you go out here, you make a left. That's where we're going to go. There's a monument there. It's in the, in the trees or in the bushes. You can't really see it. But this is what it says. In remembrance of the kindness of David Miller, 35 years the proprietor of Claremont, this tablet has been placed by his neighbors. I want to know this man. How many of you have a monument put up by your neighbors? <laughs> Me neither. This seems to be a really incredible man here. And yet, the bushes obscure that monument. You'll see it when you go out. It's right as you turn, right at the wall. Uh, Bill and I, we heard about it. We were looking at it for a month. Couldn't find it. Walked right past it, what, 20, 30 times. It's right there. So, um, This Claremont Hotel has some of the most famous people in the country come here. This, oh, there. You see, you're sitting on it. That cement walkway was the walkway right to the hotel. And you know who walked up that walkway? General Ulysses S. Grant, right here. Another famous general from the Civil War was also here. He's here today. Where is General Lee? General Lee, do you remember stopping here at the gate? 
1863? You did. <laughs> there is a story here, a local legend, uh, because remember, after the fight here in Monterey, the rest of the Confederate Army comes up this road. Actually, Longstreet's men come up this road. Lee is with Longstreet. Lee, uh, and if some of you actually go down the road a little further, on the left-hand side of the road, a little far down the hill, there's actually still a water trough for horses. It was placed in the, like halfway up the mountain because by that time your horses are dying. You need to get them some water so they can continue to get up to the slope. Lee actually watered his horse in that trough. It's still there today. It has like flowers in it. It's really incredible for an old-fashioned water trough. Uh, Lee will come up here. He will rest his horse traveler and himself under the shade of a chestnut tree, which was right at the beginning of this lane at the gate we came in. Remember now? There you go. In the hotel for many, many decades was a picture of that chestnut tree. And they honored it because General Lee had stayed under it. Sadly, the hotel burns in 1934. And I've tried to find if anyone has the picture. I don't know any of you local people, if you know who had it. I, I've talked to a couple of people. They say it still exists. I'd love to get, you know, find it and get a shot of it. But this is the famous chestnut tree. It will be burned down with the hotel. How that happens, the hotel's over here and the chestnut tree's over there, but it literally burns. And uh, it was an icon here up in the village of uh, Monterey. Yeah, here's what she says. Some years prior to 1934, the tree was set on, oh, here it is. Tree was set on fire by vandals. But an oil painting of the spreading chestnut by Mrs. Godfrey hung on the parlor wall of the hotel, admired by many Claremont guests, and it burned in the fire. Yeah, so that's that. Well, what are you going to do? <laughs> Someone told me it still exists. You never believe this stuff, right? If it's out there, it's out there. Remember you were down at the railroad track? This is what it actually looked like. Tre Troy was talking to you about having no trees. This is what it looked like. He wasn't kidding. There are no trees. They had a big furnace business going on along here. Today you saw where the track cuts across the road. Well, there's the Waynesboro Emmitsburg Turnpike. Here's the railroad. And this is the old Benchhoff house. Joe and Rex are here. I saw Joe. He, he really helped me with a lot of stuff. Um, it's also law that Lee stops there for lunch at the Benchoff house. The house is still there. It's a beautiful stone house. I'm sorry. Yeah, that might be helpful, huh? You got to show the people at home. Good chat. Okay. I think I'm pretty much done. Unless, oh yeah. Here's a picture of Emac, young man, 20 years old, very handsome. Gary Muller put me in touch with Emac's descendants today. Jim, James Emac, he lives in Kansas City, Missouri, and he sent me this picture of young Emac and this picture of young Emac. Let me tell you what the kind of man this, this guy was. This is the letter, if I can find it. Yeah, okay. This is to Dora, the sister. You no doubt heard I was wounded at Monterey, Pennsylvania in a cavalry uh, fight. And in all probability, my condition has been exaggerated. I was struck with a shell on my right knee. And, oh, I'm sorry, I was shot through both arms and a right hand. Also was struck with a shell on my right knee and that wound was uh, um, more painful than either of my arms. It was a week before I could walk without the assistance of someone, and I had to be assisted on and off my horse as if I were a child. I was very severely bruised with saber cuts over my shoulders and arms, which have not entirely disappeared. I had 210 men protecting the wagon train against cavalry. We held them in check until all am ammunition had given out. That gone, the Yankees charged us, and soon they found out that the wagons were free to be hit. Okay. I think I missed something.
Gee, I can't believe I missed. Must have lost it. Anyway, this is what he says. That basically he's not wounded very hard, very much. He's got five wounds. Yeah, it's not too bad. I can handle it. I thought it actually said it in here. How, could, how did I miss that? Yeah, okay, and anyway. But it is something to tell your family I'm wounded five times, but it's not that bad. I'm, I'm hanging in there. I had to lift him on and off his horse. 21 years old. When I was 21, what was I looking for? A beer and a place to sit down and a girl. This guy is defending the wagon train of the Army of Northern Virginia. Pretty American. What's that? Don't get started. Okay. Troy, do you have anything else? Anything else? There we go. Uh, the reason we stopped here, this is where the Monterey Hotel was. And by the way, you know the colored picture I showed you? It's wrong. It wasn't the Claremont. <laughs> but this is the Monterey House. Okay? Let me bring it close. Michael, you want to get the big one? You see this circular driveway here? It ran right in front of the Monterey House. The Monterey House sat right here. And some of the foundation is still there today. On the other side of that house was this little cabin called a cottage. The birthplace of royalty. Do you know who was? You got it? Okay. You know who was born in that house? Who? Wallace Simpson. Who is she? You don't know? You ever hear of King Edward? The man who abdicates the throne of England? This is the woman he abdicates it for. She's born right here. Blue Ridge Summit women. I'm telling you. You bet. A king gives up his kingdom for her. Uh, if only I could meet someone like that. All right. Uh, this is the Monterey Hotel. Very important place. All the hotels up here. This is a famous resort area. All the glitterati from Washington came here. And, uh, you know, for the, the medicinal springs, the fresh mountain air, and these beautiful resorts here. Uh, once the automobile was invented, this place loses its luster. But when the trains were able to bring people up here, this was a tremendous uh, resort area. As you can see, what kind of weather? I bet it's steaming down in the valley of Gettysburg right now. Look at this, a beautiful breeze up on the mountain. Uh, again, I want to thank Mrs. Bradley for sharing all the stuff she has here. We're gonna, I'm going to cut this short. I'm going to transition over to Troy on the other side. We're going to talk about the fighting here, okay? Any questions about that? Troy, go ahead. Okay, I'm going to transfer you over to the scene of the continued battle. So let's move across the way. Okay, we're heading down the final stretch. We're going to deal with the battle at Monterey now. That We're going to pick up where Mike left off with the actual fight. Mike pointed out that, that Emick, with a smaller force, was looking for a choke point to try to slow down the, the numerically superior force under Kilpatrick and Custer. Emick knew, as Mike pointed out at that last stop, which would be the later location of the Claremont Hotel, he knew that once he lost that position, he lost this hill. We're on a hill that guards the pass that's behind us, where all the supply trains are moving through. He knew his last stand was where Claremont Hotel would later be at our last stop. He gives up the ghost there. It's Major Henry Clay Potter's squadron of the 18th Pennsylvania that surrounds him, and he pulls back to here and then continues on down the road. We're going to go to that road uh, shortly. We're going to show you the old bedding of the road. That'll be our last stop. Custer and Kilpatrick are able to come up to the Monterey Hotel, which is the centerpiece for this fight. And they, there is an account of Custer being right at the entrance to the gate. We can see General Custer moving around now. <laughs> right on cue. And he's going to put in effect a plan. Okay, you know, a lot of you know I like to talk about plans. I don't believe these guys just showed up and shot. I think they calculated. And Kilpatrick and Custer are going to have a little discussion. And it's decided that they want to place 
Pennington's, Lieutenant Pennington's battery here in the middle of the road, flanked on either side by Company A of the 1st Ohio. From there, they're going to dismount. Now, going back to what Mike said earlier, just to refresh, it's dark, it's midnight July 4th, wee hours of the morning of July 5th, water's coming down in a rainstorm, it's just coming down in sheets. It's as though the, you know, the gods are crying after the Battle of Gettysburg or perhaps the gun smoke of the battle interfered with the Earth's atmosphere. Whatever's happening, it's raining solid and it has been since about 6.30 p.m., just three, what, two and a half hours after Pickett's charge ends. And in this driving rainstorm where they can only see each other by occasional blast of the cannon or a lightning strike or a flash of the muzzle, in this drowning rainstorm, General Custer decides to send forward the 6th Michigan to the right of the road, dismounting them, and then behind them, dismounting the 5th Michigan under Colonel Russell Algier. Purposefully, he sends them to the right of the road. Finally, he sends and in in dismounted form the 7th Michigan Cavalry. He's placing them all to the right of the road. There are a couple of reasons that Mike and I can see for this, for this, this part of this plan. One, the trains that they're trying to capture are on a road today known as Iron Springs Road, but that portion of the road that runs over Monterey Peak is condemned now. There are some remnants of that road back there. It was known as Maria Furnace Road at the time, but that's where all those supply trains are. To refresh from the first stop where Mike spelled this out, we have, if you count that there are 20,000 horses pulling these wheeled vehicles and that a horse or a mule can eat up to 20 to 30 pounds of hay or oats per day. And if you do the mathematics, even a conservative estimate tells you that there are probably 400,000 pounds of hay or oats in wagons going through that pass. Accompanying them are miles and miles of ordnance trains with munitions. Miles and miles of ambulances are passing just to the north of here through Cashtown Pass on a parallel track, a 17-mile-long train of wounded, end-to-end -end of wagons. Pushing through this same pass, and Custer's about ready to threaten that pass, would have been tanners, would have been blacksmiths that are there to reshot horses in case they break along the way. Uh, there are carpenters to repair wagons, turkin turkeys, chickens, Bellows from iron factories are all being shuttled south. Bags of flour. Lee will feed his army till nearly November on captured foodstuffs in this campaign. He's trying like heck to get through the mountain. He knows there's relatively safe safety on the other side of Monterey Pass. If you look at Kent Brown's book, he brings out some startling revelations that there were as perhaps as many as 20,000 sheep, 30,000 hogs, 20,000 heads of cattle all being pushed. And as Custer makes his plan to make it an attack, it's a downpour, but in the background you hear, moo, moo, and, and hogs making their squealing noises, which intensifies by Custer's attack. Now, why is he sending men to the right of the road? Largely for two reasons. One, there was a swamp on the left. It's still there. So his left is protected by the landscape. To the right, though, by moving to the right, he's pressing towards those trains that Emic is trying or Emac is trying to cover. And so by pushing in that direction, it puts the pressure on the Confederates to be pinned down with their backs to the trains. It puts them in one place, and it's going to clear the way for a decisive mounted charge, which we'll discuss at the last stop. Monterey Pass, exit strategy, Lee's retreat. We're moving to the last stop, the last act in this drama. Follow closely. Let's go back out that way, to your right. Follow Mike. Hey, Roy and Bill and myself yeah. having such fun doing this stuff. Uh, here's a picture of Major Harmon. I didn't get to show too much. He's a grizzled old veteran, tough as nails. He will swear up and down. Now, Troy, Troy swears he's not a relative. You know, Troy is a uh, preacher's son, right? See, what do you think? Looks pretty good. When I'm, oh, I'm sorry. That's what I thought. <laughs> Looks like Troy. Uh, when I, I, 
I'm, I've misread that comment by uh, Emac. I just want to do it again because it was just so silly. Also, the picture, the color picture I showed you, that was the Monterey Hotel. It wasn't the Claremont. It's all Michael's fault. Right there. There he is. There he is. It's his fault, not mine. Okay. Yes, I do. I will have it for you in just a moment. But here's, here's what I missed here. This is uh, Emac, uh, Captain Emac. You, by the way, I also said he's the first Virginia, first Maryland Cavalry Company B. You no doubt heard I was wounded at Monterey, Pennsylvania in a cavalry fight. And in all probability, my condition has been exaggerated. Five wounds. Saber cuts on both arms, the hands, the knee, everything's bleeding. Can't even get on his horse. That's exaggerated. It's the kind of 21-year-old 20 I want fighting for me. That's for sure. You bet. You know, these men here are fighting for this country, you know, their own countries on both sides. We got kids fighting today. Same thing. Freedom is not free. I don't have the picture, I'm sorry, of the uh, Claremonts. In any case, I'm going to read you from Colonel Alger's letter. He's the Colonel of the 5th Michigan Cavalry who was ordered up to this position here. Many of you know about the bridge, okay? Well, you see that little bridge out there, right? This is what Colonel Al Alger has to say about it. Uh, he basically feels that it's a huge chasm. He's worried that the Confederates have basically taken up the wooden planks. And if he goes charging across, they're going to go down into this gorge of incredible distance. Arriving at Monterey House on the top, of the mountain at midnight with my regiment, the 5th Michigan Cavalry, in the advance, having had a skirmish on the way up with the outpost of the enemy. The 6th Michigan Cavalry soon after came up and was ordered down the road to intercept the wagon train, the enemy coming down the mountain road from Gettysburg. The mountain road from Gettysburg is right at the end of this path. You go down and see you. I don't know if we're going to have time, but we'll see. It cuts in across 16 and intercepts. Waynesboro, Emmitsburg, Turnpike, right up there. I'm going to say this once, and I want you to all say it with me. This road in front of us, the modern 16, is not here. I don't want to have anyone ask me, did the fight occur on that road, okay? This is modern 16. And all the accounts say that this was a huge chasm here with Red Run, and they, were very, they couldn't really jump it. It was really difficult. Did anybody go over and look at it? It's like four feet deep today. How can, how can you reconcile that with the accounts here, OK? Well, the way you can reconcile it is because of modern 16. They literally gouged out a hole through this mountain going east-west, OK? This area has all been basically cut up. You notice coming down Charmian Road, all of a sudden it was kind of level. All of a sudden we got to a point. And there it went down. The road used to be up here, way up here. That's what's changed here. They gutted all of this out. This is all different than today. The road and the ground was way up here. And the, um, the Waynesboro Turnpike was up here. And we believe, at least I believe, we're having a little discussion on it. We're still not sure. But I believe that is the side of the bridge. But it was way higher than it is today. OK? Colonel Alger, he says, um, yeah, dismounting, we went down and found a bridge over a deep chasm, evidently 30 or 40 rods from the intersection of the roads. Intersection of the roads is right up there. If any of you want to go a little later in your car as you drive up that road, there's two houses. The first two were not there at the time. The third house is the toll house. We have a picture of that toll house on the right. There you go. I'll show it around. I want to show it to the camera first. This is around the 1890s. Look at the dress. Do you know what a toll house was for? <laughs> taking money. Not toll house cookies, taking money. But you were paying a toll for them to maintain the road, right? The ground you were on? Wrong. 
What are you doing with these roads if you're a farmer? You're driving animals down them to market. That's how you get them to market. That's how you sell them. You want to make sure the fences on that road are maintained. That's what you're paying for when you pay for a toll road. Not the road itself. You're paying for the fences to be maintained. You want your animals all over the place running down the road? No, everyone is money to you. That's what you're paying with a toll road. So that was the toll house. And you see they actually have the little toll gate on there. But that's where the two roads intersected. Colonel Alger, the 5th Michigan, they're going to be here, basically on the road and a little to the left, OK? The 6th Michigan is going to be right here. A lot of people are confused. They think the fighting, the cavalry, or I should say the Maryland boys, Emac and his men, which now are about 200, because they've been joined by about 100 men of uh, the 6th Virginia Cavalry under Jones and the 4th North Carolina from Robertson. About 100 men that Rumble Jones brings with him, and they form. But they don't form at the road. They form here in front of us, basically this position. OK? That's why uh, Troy was talking about the left flank of the Union is protected by a swamp out there. You all know the swamps there today. 16 goes right through it, but it was really swampy, so that protected. This is the way they're facing. They're fighting through these woods. And Troy made an allusion to this. As the wagon train's coming down the road, the animals get loose. you got guys firing here, left and right, in pitch black, thunder, lightning, cannons going off, and you got moo cow in the middle of the fighting. Cow, everything. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Ah, I got no shame. I have no shame. But can you imagine the chaos? Because remember, there are men dying here. No fight where men die is unimportant to that man who dies here. This is hollow ground right where you're standing today. I'm going to let Troy take it from here. Very well done, Mike. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> to finish this fight, we, we must mention that at the crucial stage of the fight, Judson Kilpatrick sees the jugular and is going to decide to go for it and sent Charles Capehart to the front. He was in charge of the 1st West Virginia. He would win the Medal of Honor for this attack. Capehart was told by Custer to charge right directly for the bridge that Mike discussed. It was, it was a wooden bridge, a plank bridge. Russell Alger, the colonel of the 5th Michigan, had made a preemptive move across the bridge and, as Mike indicated, moved some of his troops to the left of the road. Once the bridge is secure, Custer urges Capehart to go forward with the 1st West Virginia. Now notice, all the men we've mentioned so far, 5th, 6th, 7th Michigan, are dismounted. But now comes the mounted charge. There are a couple of reasons for this. One. This is the moment they've been waiting for to cross that bridge in grand style. Two, if you're going to stop wagons, and I think Mike pointed out earlier the average size wagon was the size of a school bus. If you're going to stop wagons and stop a whole train, you need men at the same height as the driver, so they need to be on horse. Men that are on the ground on foot, they can't very well run up to the wagons and say, please stop. You've got to have men at their level mounted on horseback. They've been waiting for this moment. Now, as Lieutenant Colonel Bill Hewitt points out, one of our rangers here at Gettysburg, Capehart is given the order to not fire a shot. He's supposed to close in to close distance where it's saber fighting. The reason for that, they can't see friend or foe well. They're in the dark. And the best way to avoid friendly fire is just to use the blade. This cavalry attack probably included about 100 brave men in the 1st West Virginia. They went across the bridge and caught up with the wagon train. They would have been riding up to individual drivers screaming in their ears in a driving downpour, holding a pistol to their face or maybe a blade to their throat telling them to halt. As they moved on over top of that extension of Monterey Peak, 
Some of the horses bolted, especially with Pennington shells flying over this gulf and bursting above, creating lightning strikes in appearance. Flash, flash bulb effects caused the animals to become frightful, plunge forward, and go over the cliffs. Um, Mike actually talked with some local folk here who have, as little kids, roamed down below the cliffs along what is today the modern Waynesboro Turnpike, and they found wreckage of the carriages that fell over the cliffs. Amick had tried to get these trains to stop. He wanted some of them to stay back on top of Monterey Peak and presumably some of them to continue on to Rouserville and create a gap where he was going to make a stand at the bridge. Grumble Jones, who would come in with the 6th Virginia and 4th North Carolina and choose Battery to try to support, would order those trains to keep moving. Going back to our original theme, exit strategy, get out of here, keep it moving. Emick was thinking about fighting. Grumble Jones knows the bigger picture, which is orders are coming from the top, keep moving. Counting all the infantry and, and all the forage in the ordnance trains, it's a 57 mile long train. And they've got to keep it moving. Between here and Leitersburg, actually Leitersburg has overtaken, uh, Mike may have mentioned this earlier, C.H. Berman, the local civilian, rode with the 1st Vermont Cavalry. Those are the guys from Richmond's brigade, or formerly Farnsworth's brigade. They had made the uh, ill-fated assault on July 3rd. Well, they moved further south and crossed through another pass to try to intercept those trains on the other side of the mountain. Depending on who you read, as many as 1,100, 1,300, or 1,500 Confederates were captured. An estimated 250 of those bus-sized wagons. This would be something Kilpatrick was very proud of, um, and it fit with Meade's orders to harass the flanks in the rear. Now, I would like to, as we wind down, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Mike for some final thoughts as well. I was looking through a book someone gave me. Actually, this person, George McFarland, might be on our tour. And I double-checked the account to make sure it shores up with the official records, and it does. But this is out of a book that was first published in 1836 called How to Win Friends and Influence People. Have you ever heard of it? It was a bestseller many times over. But the reason why George McFarland gave it to me is he was fascinated that it, it, it had Lincoln's letter in it related to the fights in Monterey Pass and, and other passes to the south of here and Lee's overall retreat. Lincoln, upon hearing that Lee's army got not only through this pass and other passes, but eventually across the Potomac at Williamsport in Falling Waters, 50-some miles south of here, and that he escaped south of the river, feeling... Uh, Depressed, maybe, and extremely disappointed, he constructed this letter. This is the president, Abraham Lincoln, a letter signed to General Meade. My dear general, I do not believe you appreciate the magnitude of the misfortune involved in Lee's escape. He was within our easy grasp, and to have closed upon him would, in connection with our other late successes, have ended the war. As it is, the war will be prolonged indefinitely. Lincoln writes, if you could not safely attack Lee last Monday, that's the proposed attack on the 12th of this month before Lee made his final vestiges of retreat across the Potomac. If you could not attack him last Monday, how can you possibly do so south of the river when you can take with you very few, no more than two-thirds of the force you then had in hand? It would be unreasonable to expect and I do not expect that you can now affect much. Your golden opportunity is gone, and I am distressed immeasurably, immeasurably because of it. This is, this is Lincoln to me. Now, the author goes on. He's talking about leadership. In fact, this cha uh, chapter is entitled Fundamental Techniques in Handling People. And he makes, a, he makes a good, I think, guess or intuitive grab on why Lincoln refused to send that letter. It was found in his papers after his death. He never sent it to me. And the author, Carnegie, writes that Meade may have, or Lincoln may have speculated, if I send this letter, 
It will relieve my feelings, but it will make me try to justify himself. According to Carnegie's analysis, he wrote, it will make him condemn me. I will arouse hard feelings, impair all of his further usefulness as a commander, and perhaps force him to resign from the army. And in, and in keeping with leadership and good leadership, sharp criticisms and rebukes almost invariably end in futility. These are some of the thoughts that might have crossed through Lincoln's mind. We can only speculate why, because Meade slept on it. That's a good leadership principle, by the way. If you're angry, sleep on it. Okay, and then maybe write it on paper. That'll purge it from your system, and then it can be worked out with a clearer train of thought the next day. Now, to pull all of this together, Lincoln was not out in the field. He was getting information from Daniel Sickles and from others, right? And he was formulating an, an opinion long distance. He didn't see the bloodshed at Gettysburg. We love Lincoln, but we understand he has political pressures weighing down on him that might cause him to write this for a couple of hours and then take it back. As we look at the big picture, Lee, once Lee makes it through Monterey Pass with most of the 57 mile long train, and that includes the infantry that's following behind, Kilpatrick and Custer were able to move in between the two and try to harass the train, but the infantry soon follows and Kilpatrick has to move because there are thousands of Lee's army right behind them. Once they make it, the Confederates make it to the other side. How many of you have ever seen Tom and Jerry? Okay, once, once Jerry makes it into the hole in the wall, he's in relative safely from Tom, right? Mike mentioned this early on in the program about the importance of passes. Once you go through the pass, it's like the mouse making it through the hole in the wall. He's in the Cumberland Valley, is Lee. Where is Robert E. Lee? you must have felt a great sense of relief at that time as you, as you made it through. Now you're going to offer your resignation to Jefferson Davis. Mr. Davis? No, it's, not it's not going to happen. Step forward so we can see you, Mr. Davis. It's not, <laughs> it's not going to happen. There's relative safety on, the other si safety on the other side. Why? Because the Confederates then control egress through those passes. Whether it be Cash down Monterey and further south, Raven Rock, uh, Turner Crapton, Fox, Aldi, Middleburg, Upperville, any of those passes, whether they be wind passes, as Hans Hensel likes to point out, are different from fault passes, whether they are fault passes and they're long and easily traversed, or whether they're taller, steep wind passes, in all cases, those passes are controlled by Confederate cavalry during the retreat. Why is Emick here fighting with so few men? Because Confederate cavalry are covering other passes to the south. They are the mouse holes that lead to Lee's long train. In retrospect, and these are my final thoughts, Keith Poulter, who uh, was formerly in charge of North and South magazines, actually technically owns uh, North and South and another newer version of, of a broader military magazine that's just come out. Keith Poulter wrote in that same issue that we mentioned earlier, the 1999 North and South special issue of the retreat, which I highly recommend, order a back order through North and South. Poulter makes the point that if, Lee, if Meade had wanted to destroy Lee's army, he would have started moving on July 5th before news of the fight at Monterey Pass, that he would have headed towards Frederick, moved through the passes at Middletown, to cut under the retreat, put himself between Lee and the Potomac. That's what Grant did at Vicksburg. He cut off Pemberton's line of retreat. It led to 30,000 men being starved and, and surrendering. That's what Grant did at Appomattox. When he put roughly 30,000 men in the path of Lee's retreat, Lee remarked, I'd rather die a thousand deaths than see General Grant for this surrender. And historians have remarked that his men would have died that had he not gone to surrender. Lee had the line drawn in the sand in front of him at Appomattox. Meade did not cut off Lee's retreat. The orders to Pleasanton was to attack the flanks in the rear, not cut off the retreat. When Lee attacked Meade at Gettysburg, he never allowed his men to circle around to either the Tawny Town Road or the Baltimore Pike. Why? He was not trying to fight a battle of annihilation. He wanted the Union Army 
to fall back and attack them in a pursuit mode. This seems to be what me was trying to do to some degree. So we're left with the understanding that Meade was comfortable with Lee leaving and going across the Potomac. But before we become critical, we're just, we're just observing, we're acknowledging facts, but before we become too critical, consider that Lee, a much more experienced commander at this level of command, had opportunities after Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Second Manassas, and did he ever pull off a pursuit that was successful? No. The Union Army was able to get away from him each time. General Hancock helped the Union Army pull back after Chancellorsville. That would help uh, his star rise. But a retreat, as Bill Dowling pointed out earlier, is very difficult to pull off. It's also difficult for the pursuer when he has to try to peek through passes between here and Virginia. Meade defeated Lee. He allowed Lee to escape. Cutting him off at the Potomac was easier said than done. Um, as I sign off, I want to say a couple of things. One is I want to thank John McClellan, who um, wrote a book that's at the local library. You might want to go and check it out, or I can tell you later on how to order it. It gives us a lot of local history. It's uh, of Blue Ridge Summit, this area. I'd like to thank OB, Gary O'Brien, who's in the audience, who also helped us. And on behalf of Gettysburg National Military Park, and this is not the final uh, say, Mike's going to say a couple more things, but on my part, this is, this is the end for me, I'd like to say on behalf of Gettysburg National Military Park, our Chief of Interpretation, Brian Fitzgerald, who's here, on behalf of the guides, the licensed guides, we love you, and we thank you for coming out, and we hope you have a, a wonderful day, and we urge you also to go out and see the afternoon program, which starts at 3 o'clock, uh, that's an hour and f at 50 minutes from now. Okay, we started at quarter after. We're, th we're just under three hours that we've been on this program. You've got time to make it to the afternoon pickets charge or union defense of starting at 3 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bill wants to say something? Yeah. As far as the military theorists go, just following up on what Troy has said, at the conclusion of this action, what happens? The balance of power, the equilibrium between the two armies, that pendulum that has swung over to Meade, now has swung back, and that balance of power at an equilibrium is restored by Lee during this retreat. Thank you all once again for coming out. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. I just want to thank everybody, everybody, especially here, uh, John Miller. Uh, John also is a historian. He's also the vice president of the Emmitsburg Historical Society. He's the one that was handling all of the uh, reenactors today. They're going to be here doing a little live firing in a little bit. Also, Kent Brown is going to be signing his book here. Also. No one cooks food better than firemen. There's going to be roast beef platters down at the fire hall, and then maybe have lunch and then head out to the afternoon program back at the park. Uh, you might be, huh? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm going to get to it. Uh, you might be wondering how we know all these places where Lee was. Well, many of, of you, I'm sure, have seen this photograph before. It's the famous Brady photograph after Lee comes back from Appomattox. His son is there, and the little gentleman here, thin little guy, where are we? Over here. That is Walter Taylor. You remember this scene, right, General? You were there. Okay. Well, Walter Taylor came through this area with General Lee, and many, many years after the war, he was going to buy property up in Blue Ridge Summit four properties, because his daughter is su uh, suffering from tuberculosis, and you know there's a famous uh, clinic up here in the mountains. He buys four properties. Uh, the land is still there today. Dr. Bridger, who was here, the doctor in this area from 1915 till 1965, 
and whose daughter is Undine uh, Warner, and Megan here, who is driving the traffic, is her, is her relative. Dr. Bridger was the best friend of the son of Walter Taylor. And as kids, he would take them around and show them all the places where Lee was. As Troy always likes to say, I'll take local lore anytime because of the people that were there and they saw it. You can't get closer to Robert E. Lee than Walter Taylor, can you? So, again, the history and the people of this town, I didn't know anything about this. They showed me. I'm just relating the story to you. I want to thank all of you. I hope you have a wonderful time. Hopefully we'll do this again sometime. And thank you very, very much. Oh.